Okay, Rabbi, I think we can get started. Uh, who's to okay. blame? There are lots and lots of people I'm sure to blame, as you so always, uh, always pass around the blame to lots of people. Let's say who can get all the credit for making things better. Okay, Vakash, always a pleasure. A relief tag who, who kicks off every week on Torn Motion with his Sunday morning class. And uh, Vakash, Rabbi. Yeah, I'll start with my screen and my title. Uh, destruction of Yerushalayim, and who's to blame? The farmers, the bankers, or the prophets? Uh, before we begin, just a word. The uh, custom is, based on prophets, etc., the fast days are not only to remember what happened, it's to remember why they happened. So even though our Torah study might be more than the classic things um, about the stories about the Korban, um, especially the Me'iri, almost all the post scheme hold, it's okay to study Torah in the sense of learning from what happened, how to improve our ways so it won't happen again. The um, I want to throw. I know we're not supposed to ask questions to the group. Just real quick, I want to just get a feeling if people understand my title. Um, give me a reason why the farmers might be to blame for the base of Mikdash being destroyed. Let me stop this shemitah? for a minute. What? Ob observing Shemitah. Yeah, and why would observing Shemitah be the reason for the korban? Uh, it was for the first one. Okay, according to who? A year no, ago. Okay, we'll see. Okay, that'll be our first topic. Okay. Um, why would you call it the bankers? They're always to blame, right? Lending by river. Yeah. Lending by river. Or lending, maybe lending, lending money with uh, either stealing money or lending money with um, interest and things like that. And why yeah. would it be the profits? No. Well, that goes back to they the couldn't. story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Uh, that would be the rabbis. I, I, didn't put the rab I didn't put the rabbis here. I put the prophets. Does Neri now say that the prophet or uh, does say that the uh, prophets didn't rebuke the people? It could be the prophets or the rabbis didn't rebuke. We'll see. Nevi uh, um, Sheker. Oh yeah. When you say Nevi Sheker, I'll translate Nevi Sheker. That's a false prophet. And what what God do false prophets work for? What, what, what's false about a false prophet? Is he representing a false god? No, he, he said things Hashem didn't tell him. To say. Or he's saying he's representing our god in a false way. So that, that we have to see who the false prophets are. They're big. Okay, that was a little introduction. I will get to work. What I want to begin with, I'm going to read the very end of Tanakh. Not chronologically end, but almost most Tanakhim that we have, our custom is Diberi Hayamim. It's the last book. In, in our 24 books and most in most printings of Tanakh. And if Divra Yamim is in, we're going to read the last about 10 lines of Divra Yamim that talks about the temple being destroyed. Um, and we're going to see the reasons Divra Yamim um, brings. And that'll be our springboard to try to understand who's to blame for the Korban. Because we'll see, um, as Nabim should do, they try to help us understand what, what caused things to go wrong. So I'm going to share my screen. If you want to follow with the Tanakh inside, it's fine. But this is the last chapter of Divar Amin Bet, 2 Chronicles, chapter 36. Of course, the last king was Sitkiel. I'm assuming you know that. Sitkiel was um, 100, but I'm sorry. Um, he was 21 when he became king. He was king for 11 years. Bayasar Rabbeinu Hashem, he did evil. Here's the first thing. V'lo nichna mifnei Yirmiyahu Hanavi mipi Hashem. He didn't submit himself to Yirmiyahu. We have to see what that means. But right away we're saying maybe, maybe the king is to blame for not listening to Yirmiyahu. But what did Yirmiyahu tell him to do? We have to see. The Gam b'Melech Nebuchadnezzar Morad. He rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, so again, so far we're blaming the king, Tzitkiel. Okay? And Nebuchadnezzar made him swear loyalty. We'll say allegiance. We'll get to that story later on. But he hardened his neck and he um, hardened his heart and he basically rebelled against the Babylonian king, even though he's supposed to be subservient to him. We'll see, that'll be the political reason for the for Nebuchadnezzar sending the army back to take over Jerusalem. Okay. Who else is to blame? Now we're putting not just the head of the government, all the ministers in the government and the people are to blame. They did something bad against God. Just like the bad ways of the nations, what these tovot are unclear. 
they defiled the temple, which was uh, dedicated to be in Yerushalayim. So there's doing something wrong with the temple service as well. God did his most to prevent the temple from, be, from being destroyed by sending his, we'll see his prophets. This word, Hashkem Shalach, means early in the morning, sending it over and over again. God sent his prophets to warn the people because he had mercy on them. He had compassion for them and for his house and tried to prevent the temple from being destroyed. Right? They would make fun, they would mock and belittle the, the um, prophets sent by God. Those are called uh, angels of God or messengers of God. They made fun of what they were saying. In other words, here it says God's sending prophets to tell the people how to repent. And the people are being blamed for mocking the prophets and not listening to the prophet. Okay. God sent the king of the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, against them. And that's why the Babylonians killed our young men uh, when they destroyed the temple. And they did not have mercy on the young and the old. And, and everything was given to the Babylonians. On top of that, that's all the vessels of the temple were taken to, into exile. Now here's the Chorban. They destroyed the temple. They burnt the temple. They broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They burnt all the uh, Arbanot, all of the um, big buildings, the castles. And basically, they destroyed the whole city. They exiled the city uh, by sword. Everyone was exiled to Bavel. And the Jewish people were basically in service to the Vakanetzar until the Persians took over. Now, this is all build up. This is the famous story of the Korban. Now, listen carefully. The rise of Babylonia, the, their success of a Babylonian army to destroy the temple and exile the city and destroy not just the temple, but the entire city was fulfilling the word of God to Yermiel. Listen carefully. Until the land filled its uh, Shabbatot, which sounds like it's Shemitah years. The entire time of its desolation, the land was desolate. To fulfill the 70 years. Now, it sounds like here that the reason why God allowed the Babylonians to destroy the temple was because we didn't keep Shemitah. Agreed? Mm -hmm. right. And that's why if we didn't keep Shemitah, therefore the farmers are to blame. The problem yeah. is Yirmiyahu never says that. Okay. We're quoting here the Malot of Shemipir Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu talks about the temple, the possibility of the temple being destroyed and Jerusalem being destroyed, but he doesn't link it to Shemitah. For some reason, Right? The end of Devarimim links it to Shemitah. So we have to see why. What's the connection between Shemitah and the temple being destroyed? And why is Devarimim relating that to Yermiel? And at first glance, it sounds like it's um, it sounds like the reason why the temple was destroyed is because Amisro did not keep Shemitah properly. And if you know Daniel, you know um, Rabbi Shulman's giving a whole series on Daniel. I think he gave one of his classes about doing the calculations how many Shemitah years did we not keep during the first temple period? And it comes out to possib possibly 70 Shemitah cycles, but that gets really complicated, the, uh, um, that calculation. I'm going to say something a little bit different, what it means to fulfill the 70 years, where it's coming from. Okay. And then Isn't I just want to end. Isn't that Pasuk Parrot? The Pasuk and the Tocha and the Tukhasai? Exactly. We're going to get that. We're going to, that's going to be our next source. That this is clearly relating, it's relating to a Pasuk in Bahar Kotai, but it's not what Yirmiyahu says. Yirmiyahu doesn't link Shemitah to, Yirmiyahu talks about 70 years. Yirmiyahu, he talks about Hashama, about desolation, but doesn't link it to Shemitah. He links it to something else. What I want to do in the share, I want to link, um, I want to give a reason why the Torah talks about, when it comes to Shemitah, it talks about desolation of the temple. And why the end of Divra Amin wants to tie that together to Yermiel, because Yermiel is going to give a very different reason for the temple being destroyed. He'll talk about primarily lack of social justice. Now, 
I just want to end with the end of Divrei Amim, the first year of Koresh, the famous um, edict that uh, Koresh allows the Jews to return. But what's important to Divrei Amim is the words of Yirmiyahu. What I want to point out is that the, the, the final reason in Divrei Amim relating this to Yirmiyahu in the 70 years is not to connect it necessarily to Shemitah, but to say the seven years are over with the fall of Bavel to the Persians. Chorus is King Chorus, King Cyrus is rise to power, and God allowing the Jews through the agency of Chorus to return to Yerushalayim. Okay. Now I'm going to, as you mentioned, I'm going to go and try to understand why this phrase, Adra starts in Shabtotel, right? where's that coming from in, in Chumash and then in Yermiel? So what we have to do now is see the laws of Shemitah and Vayikra and see what they're about. Um, if you remember, it wasn't, uh, it was just, couple of months ago already, when we read the end of Sefer Baikra and Parshat Bahar B'chukotai, we have the laws of Shemitah. Actually, it's not called Shemitah, it's called Shabbat, Shabbat Aretz, but for the purpose of our show, we'll call it the Shemitah year. It's every seven years, the land has to rest. And then after the laws of Shemitah, we have the, the famous Tochacha, if you keep my laws, I'll bless you. If you don't keep my laws, I'll punish you over and over again. The number seven comes up a lot, but there's wave after wave of punishment if we don't keep God's laws properly. And the last wave of punishment in the Tochacha in chapter 26 is as follows. I'll destroy your cities. Your temple will be destroyed. And I won't smell the sweet smell of your korbanot. Okay. Followed, pay attention to the word Vashimoti, the Shlama, which is desolation. God says, I'm going to leave the land desolate, but Shamu, and all the people passing by it will realize how desolate it is. In the Midrashic literature, they turn this almost into something positive because when we're sent out of the land, God makes sure the land remains desolate so no one else takes over. And a lot of people went that out loud that other than when, once Israel lost its sovereignty, no other country took over sovereignty of the land and made, became a separate country. There were foreign powers taking it over but no independent state took it over uh, in a situation like we were in beforehand. So God's going to leave the land desolate. Um, and then I'm going to scatter you among the nations and, and you'll be followed by sword, etc. And again, by Ta Aret Shmama, again, the land will be desolate and the cities destroyed. This is in the Tochacha and Vayikra. Now, here's the line you were mentioning. As Tirzah Aret Then when, when when the land is desolate after we're exiled, and punished. So the entire time that we're in exile, the land will now will sort of fulfill or pay back for its Shabbatot that it missed, while you're in the land of your enemies. Right? Then the land will rest and it will um, basically make up for all the Shabbatot that it missed. And then it says again, the entire time of its desolation, it will rest. So these two psukim in the end of the Tochacha definitely um, point to a correlation between Shemitah and destruction of the temple. But the question is going to be what makes Shemitah so special or so harsh that it's going to cause destruction of the temple? I've got a kach when we look at um, the more recent halachic literature about should you, you know, how much do we, um, when it comes to Shemitah year nowadays, how much do we use, like what's called Heter Mechira, how lenient we are, or how strict we have to be in Lasso Shemitah? Those who promote being very strict, they say, look how um, terrible Shemitah is, how severe it is. We better keep it because that was the reason for the Qurban. Okay. Now, um, we don't have time to read the rest of this. This is the rest of the Tocha, the people will be what he called the thing. And then finally, the hope is after all this punishment, the, we'll do tshuva for our sins in exile. Okay? And then God promises in exile, after we do tshuva, when things are so bad, then we're going to finally give in. Our, our hearts will finally give in to God. Okay? And to be, will God will forgive us for our sins. God will remember his breed with Yaakov. And then the land, after it's been left, left alone, and again, fulfilling a shepherdot, okay? Yeah, but what was the reason? Pay yourself with them. It's not only because of Shemitah, the land was desolate, 
because we went against God's laws and we didn't keep his statutes, right? which is the opening line of the Tokacha. Okay? And then God says, even though um, they've been in exile, I didn't totally give up on them. I didn't forget about them. I'm not going to break my, my treaty. I'll bring them back. I'll remember my and I'll bring you back. And then that's the end of the Tokacha and the summary of Sefer Vaikra, all these Chukim Mishpatim. Now, I want to talk, I want to use a, uh, a something we heard a lot during Corona, uh, the difference between correlation and causation. In other words, remember hearing this on the news all the time? When you have data, there's a correlation between the data, but is there causation? Meaning, there's a correlation between the fact that we go into exile, and when we're in exile, we're keeping Shemitah by default because we're not in the land. Or is causation, meaning is the reason we go into exile because we didn't keep Shemitah. Now, if you look at the Tochacha itself, when it begins, it doesn't say, if you don't keep the Shemitah, I'll punish you. It says, if you don't keep my laws, all the laws, all the Chukim Mishpatim. When the Torah talks in the Tochacha about God's punishments, he doesn't say it's one specific sin. He talks about the whole set of laws of Sefer Vayikra. So the question is, why is there so much an emphasis at the end of Sefer Baikra in the Tochacha on, on, on Shemitah when in the introduction to the Tochacha itself it talks about all the laws? Now, so again, I want to show there's a correlation but not necessarily causation. Now, to do that, I want to go back to the laws of Shemitah in chapter 25 in, in, um, in Baikra. And I wrote here, we'll do a quick discussion. What's the purpose of the Shemitah year? Is it Shemitah for the people or for the land? We'll see. And then we'll use this to explain Yimriel. But I want to claim, I'll, I'll make my claim because we don't have too much time. I'll make my opening claim and I'll try and prove it. Like anything that has Kedusha, anytime God separates something from a larger group, the Kadesh means really to separate. When God separates one day of the week and makes it special, it's for the sake of bringing God into the six days of the week. It was whenever there's Kedusha, whenever God separates one item from a larger group, it's always for the sake of the group it's separated from. So if God separates the tribe of Levi from the 12 tribes, it's to teach Torah to the remaining 11 tribes. If God's going to separate one nation from the 70 nations, it'll be to be a funnel that can bring godliness or be a model nation to have an influence and hopefully bring godliness to the other nations. That's the basic concept of Kedusha. Um, if we look at the laws of Shemitah in, per, in chapter 25 in Sefer Vayikra, it's not only the laws of, of Shemitah. What do we have? Remember, Parsha Bar, I'm just showing you the Hebrew because I want to point out a, uh, the structure. The, the Pesukim himself will see in detail. But God tells Moshe Rabbeinu in Har Sinai, remember the famous question, all the laws were given in Har Sinai, why is this um, emphasizing these laws were given in Har Sinai? Okay, tell B'nai Israel. Um, every six years, excuse me, work your field. The seventh year is the Shemitah year, or Shabbat, uh, a Shabbat for the land. Okay? Then we have seven cycles of Shemitah and Yovel. And then we're told the land should not be sold forever. The land belongs to God. We're like Gerim and Toshavim. And then every, every 50 years, the land will have Gulan. The land goes back to its original owner. Notice the laws of Shemitah don't end. Remember, this is chapter 25. They don't want to end with just the laws of Shemitah and Yovel. They have an application. And what I want to claim is, the way you keep Shemitah is not only by keeping Shemitah that one year out of seven, it's how you apply the message of Shemitah to the other six years. Because look what follows in the same section. Kiyamuchachicha means when your brother becomes, when falls down, when he comes in need. When a person falls, then has trouble. And what happens? And he has to sell his land. Who has to save him? The person, the word the Chumash uses to describe his savior is called the Goel. That's the name for God who takes us out of Egypt. But the Redeemer, first it should be his, uh, his um, hopefully a relative, or it could be anybody. But notice, right after the laws of Shemitah, we have laws that could be anywhere in Chumash. When a person falls apart financially, is in trouble financially and has to sell and mortgage his property. His neighbors, his family, and his friends, his neighbors have to save him. The name of that savior of the redeemer is called the Goel. Okay, 
And then you, when he does it, will leave the financial loan about how you pay for it. Okay. And the same thing applies if you sell a house. He has 12 months to, to pay back and then we'll leave the, the finances alone. Again, okay? and he has to sell himself to a to a foreigner possibly. But we have, um, and then says, I'm the God who give you the land of Kran to be your God. Then again, should you become poor or desolate and you sell yourself into slavery. Okay? So again, the Goel, the, the neighbor, or your family has to buy, buy back your freedom. Right? Or to what, what I'm pointing out is that in all these cases, the follow Shemitah, I have how we apply Shemitah to the six years when it isn't Shemitah. What do we do? By stopping work once every seven years and not being productive and living basically day by day. Remember, during Shemitah, you can eat the fruit of the land, but only take as much as you much as you need for a day at a time. Even the wealthy people, the wealthy farmers, um, they can only live a day at a time. There's food for a day at a time, and the whole country has that experience. That way, the wealthy farmer knows what it feels like to be poor, and he'll be more sensitive to the needs of the less fortunate during the six years that it's not Shemitah. As you know, in the story of Ruth and Miguel Ruth, that's how Boaz, what Boaz did. And the final line is, what's the reason Chumash gives? B'nai Yisrael actually abadim to God. We're servants of God, not slaves, but servants. And that's why I took you out of Egypt. I was your Goel. When you were in trouble, I redeemed you. The way you thank God for redeeming us from Egypt is not by saying thank you, but by acting thank you. And when you have a neighbor or a relative who is financially in straits and has to either sell his property or sell himself into slavery, it's your job to be the Goel. And therefore, what I want to claim is the purpose of the Shemitah year is not just for the, it's not just a holy land, it's a holy people. Um, just like we keep Shabbat and stop all creativity one day a week to make sure that we use our creativity properly during the six days that we're supposed to work. In the same way, we stop productivity once every seven years in our industry. But the reason we stop that productivity once every seven years is to make sure when we are productive during the six years, we're sensitive to the needs of the people less fortunate in our society. In that sense, you don't keep Shemitah once every seven years. You keep Shemitah, the message of Shemitah. In fact, the main way you keep Shemitah is the six years that it's not the Shemitah year by applying these principles of of sensitivity to a fellow Jew who's in trouble. So that's my, that's my first point. Now, if that's the case, do, if the Navi is going to say we don't keep Shemitah, it's not because the land didn't rest from a technical side. It's because we didn't fulfill the application of Shemitah of caring for your fellow Jew. And that we're going to see all through Yirmiyel. Now, if, if I just continue in the Tochacha, um, notice we have the Ten Commandments in the beginning, at the end of Parshat Bahar, including Shabbat and, and Mikdash. And then if you follow my laws and keep them properly, I'll, give, I'll bless you and you'll have, I'll allow you to keep your temple. You know the famous laws. If you don't listen to me, if you don't keep my laws, that's just the Shemitah laws. All the laws, all these, all these commandments of Sefer Vayikra, and we'll see also of Sefer um, Shemot and Devarim. If, if you reject my laws and don't keep them and don't identify with them, okay, then I'll punish you and punish you. And then finally, the land, um, ironically, it's, it'll be so bad I'll have to throw you out. And ironically, the land will keep Shemitah by default. My claim is, it's not that the reason why God's kicking you out is because the land needs to keep Shemitah, you didn't do it. But ironically, if you sin by not keeping all the laws of the Torah and not building a just society, you'll be sent into exile. And again, by default, the land will keep it Shemitah in a backhanded way because you're not living there anymore. It'll be desolate, but there'll be a correlation between Shemitah and your sins, but not causation. That's my that's my opening point. Now I want to show you um, what Yirmiyahu says. Now, what's the reason for the for the um, for the korban? But I want to do not just shmitak karkaot. I want to do shmitak safim. Shmitak safim. I'll explain what the word means. There's not just the law that every seven years we leave the land desolate and we don't um, plant any new things and we only eat whatever the land grows naturally for that year. But also, every seven years, we know all the debts. 
So it says like this in Sefer Dvarim, Bikit Sheva Shanim Taseh Shemitah. Every seven years we do Shemitah. The way I understand this is that that's referring to the Shemitah of land. And then we have a derivative of Shemitah. And because we're keeping Shemitah of the land, there's a law of called of annulling debts. What happens? Um, when does someone take a loan as opposed to taking a, a hand up? When someone's in need, you give them staka, you give them money. But if you're a farmer or you're a landowner and you have land, but it's winter time and there's no crop storing yet, it's not harvest season yet, and I need to feed my family, then I'm going to take a loan, but I have um, collateral. No, it's, well, what do I have? I have the ability to pay back the loan. Why? Because in four or five months from now, during harvest season, I'll be able to pay the, the lender back. So therefore, why do people lend money? You lend money when there's a possibility of paying back. And because you own land, but right now in the winter, I can't grow crops because it's not harvest season now. But I will have harvest, hopefully in two, three months. I can lend money and pay back during harvest season. So therefore, the Torah says... Borrow money. You can borrow money. No, but the lender will lend money and the person will borrow money. You're correct. The person will borrow money but the person lending the money is assuming he'll get his money back because it's a um, because the, the person lending the money has the ability to pay him back once we get to harvest season. The person that's borrowing person. the money. <laughs> that's called borrowing. Okay, I got the words wrong in English. Okay. The guy borrowing the money from the lender. But the person borrowing the money will be able to pay back. Now, what happens next? During the Shemitah year, there's no way the lender can pay back his loan. Because you're not, you're only allowed to take as much food as you need a day at a time. I can't collect. I, there's no asit. I can't collect my harvest that year. The harvest is free for everybody, and therefore there's no way I can pay back my loan during the shemitah year. And therefore, the Torah says at the end of the shemitah year, we annul loans in order to keep shemitah. Okay, someone not keeping shemitah laws, like a nochri, an outsider, you can take from, but you can't. You have to annul loans for people who are in the Shemitah thing. Now the Torah says something amazing. The Torah says, follows, Efes kilo right? Alas, there should not be a poor person among you because God will bless you in the land giving you to inherit. On what condition won't there be an Evyon? If you keep this mitzvah, I'm commanding you because God will bless you and you'll be lending and not borrowing. Now, is the Torah saying that if I keep Shemitah, there won't be poor people? Or is the Torah saying it's your job to make sure there's no poor people? Right? It sounds like this. It sounds like when I first read it, right? there won't be poor people. There, and Avion is someone who's destitute. You have more than poor. There's Anivi Avion. The Avion usually is worse off. Right? And Avion, they're saying there won't be an Avion because God will bless you. God will bless you if you keep the laws of Shemitah, possibly, if you keep the mitzvah. Right. But then the Torah says, when there is an Evion in your land, from one your brother, from one your brethren, anywhere you're living, okay, what do you need? Don't hold back your hand, open your hand, right? And give him what he needs. Keep a talk to okay? Open your hand and give that poor person, that destitute person, give him what he needs. So what I want to claim is when the Torah says FS Kilop, promising there won't be an Evion. It's not saying if you keep my mitzvot of Shemitah, there won't be poor people. The Torah is saying the way you keep the mitzvot of Shemitah, the way you make sure, it's your job to make sure there's no avion. In other words, the way you prevent avionim is by keeping the laws of by keeping the laws of being sensitive to people in need. And therefore, what's the Torah say? Should there be an avion? Okay. It's your job to make sure there isn't an avion. Okay. Because what's God going to say in a minute? Look down, down here. What's God say? There'll always be poor people. And therefore, God's commanding you. In other words, this is not a, God's not saying, I'm promising if you, if you keep Shemitah, there won't be poor people. He's saying the reason for Shemitah is for you to make sure there's no poor, poor people. Because the way that God makes sure there's no Vionim is by giving you the ability to help those in need. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sort of flipping it around. 
what, what God's promising. Because God's saying here at the end, there's always going to be poor people. There's always going to be poor people, but it's your job to make sure there aren't poor people. And you do that by opening up your hand. Now, I think in the, when we say this every day in the Ashrei, remember we're describing God as Potech et Yadecha, but I think what it really means is in our praise of God that God provides for everyone, how does God provide for everyone by making sure there's enough, but it's not divided proportionally. Some people get more, some people give less, get less. And God gives us the ability to take care of those in need. And therefore, when we describe God as God opening his hands and giving for everyone in need, it's telling us we have to become a partner with God and open up our hands and give those in need. Also, but the main thing I'm pointing out here is that it's our job as God's people to make sure that there aren't poor and people who are destitute, people in need, we have to help them. Now, if we don't keep that, now, that's the mitzvah, I'm getting at, that's the mitzvah of Shemitah. It's not just making sure the land is desolate, it's applying the concept of Shemitah, which is supposed to be educational, and applying it to the six years when you are working your land, and we have a regular economy. Now I'm going to show you this in Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu, during his career, um, remember, it's, it's after they found this, after they, um, you know, the worst was over with Ashur, there's the rebuilding now. Um, Ashur had fallen. Menashe died. There was a Xardin of Khorban that we're hoping to get rid to, that we're hoping to undo. Um, there's some of the exiles are returning once the Assyrians fall apart at the end of the reign of Menashe. Yoshia becomes king, and there's a mass movement of repentance. We rededicate the temple. We find the Sefer Torah. We basically rebuild the temple. We resettle our land. We're back in the Gal Galil. We're back in Udan Shomron. The country's doing great. But despite all that, Yemiel continues to rebuke the people. What does he tell them? This is a, a, a nuva of Yemiel, which is pretty generic. This is what he's been saying uh, through his entire career, as we'll see. Yemiel is talking to the people who are religious, the people coming to the Midash and Davening. They're Davening for various reasons. It could be because there's a drought, a drought we'll see. But most likely here, they're Davening to God to get rid of the Babylonians. The Babylonians now are the new superpower. No one wants them to become a new superpower. We want them out of our way. And people are praying that get the Babylonians out of, out of, out of us, out of the Middle East. So therefore, God tells Yirmiyahu, tells, God tells Yirmiyahu, Amod Bashar Beit Hashem, stand at the gate of the Beit HaMikdash, tell the people the following message, What's important here, this is the Nevo of Yirmiyahu to the religious people, the firm people coming to daven to God for their needs. People turning to God in prayer, like we do today. What does Yirmiyahu tell them? Something which is not classic. If you want to remain in this land, if you don't want the Babylonians to exile you, if you want to live well in your land, it's not enough to pray to God. You have to improve your behavior. Improve your way. Derech Hashem is doing justice and righteousness, building a kind and just society. Malachem is what you're planning to do. Darchem is what you're doing. Malachem is what you're planning on doing. And if you improve your, your social behavior, then you can continue to dwell in this land. Don't put your hopes. Okay? We'll see later on, he's referring to the words of the false prophets. We're going to play next. Okay. There's a group of God's prophets who claim to be God's prophets, representing God, giving them religious guidance, and they're telling the people who are worried about the Babylonian um, attack, if you want God to save you, come to the Beit HaMikdash and pray in his Heichal. Now, Yirmi is sort of making fun of them by repeating it three times. He's saying, the message you're getting from the majority of God's Nevim is a message that the main thing God wants is prayer and sacrifice. Come to the temple, come to the temple, come to the shul and pray. And that will, if you do that, God will answer your prayers. Yirmiyahu says it's contingent. He's saying, he's not saying differ, don't pray. He's saying prayer is not enough. Prayer needs to be transformative and has to cause a change in, in your day-to-day -day behavior. tasu. <laughs> If you do justice between you and your fellow man, and the famous lines, take care of the stranger, the orphan, the widow, don't oppress them, don't shed innocent blood, 
again, don't follow the other gods as well. Then, okay. There's, if you want to remain in the land and not be exiled, you better build a better society. He's saying it's not enough to come to the temple and pray. It's what you do when you leave the temple. My point before, if the temple is Kadosh, it's to remember how to act when you leave the temple. You don't come, you come to Shul to leave Shul, but praying in Shul has to be a transformative experience. In the same way, the Shemitah, what you do in Shemitah has to affect how you act. The remaining six years of the cycle, the same way the way you act on Shabbat affects how you act the six days of the week. When you come and pray in the temple, it has to affect how you act when you leave the temple. And now he's saying the exact opposite is happening. You're putting all your hopes in the words of these Nevi'a Sheker, who's saying the main thing God wants is prayer and sacrifice. And he gives an example of how bad things are. He says as follows, Pasuk Tet, Haganov Ratzoch Vinov Vishavad Sheker, right out of the Ten Commandments, correct? The second half. It's in your society, outside the temple, you're breaking the second half of the Ten Commandments between God, man, and his fellow man. And you're, um, you're bringing incense to Baal. What Yirmiyahu is going to do, he's going to call the people coming to Beit HaMikdash, praying for rain and praying for God's help. He's saying, you're calling this God worship. He's calling this Baal worship. Because when you worship Baal, you, you're, you're praying for rain. Now, if you believe in a rain God, if your only interest is God working for you, Yirmiyahu is going to make fun of them and call them Baal worshippers. If you know your history, Oshiel got rid of all the Baal worship way beforehand. But Yirmiyahu is being sarcastic with them, saying your service of God is like Baal worship. Okay. And then you follow these other gods and other important th other things are more important to you. And then after doing all this bad behavior outside the temple, this name that's associated with God's reputation, after having this Unjust society, you're coming to make the Mikdash to say God will save us now, so we continue to our bad ways. Yes. He says, Amar, this this Beit Mikdash looks like a hideout for criminals. He says, Amar, okay. God's name is associated with this house. And what are you doing? You're calling it a um it's like a house full of um of robbers. It can't be. Then he says, Go to my house in Shiloh. Those are my Shir and Shmuel. We just talked about this. That Bnei Eli were corrupt. They didn't know God in the biblical sense. They were unjust in their day-to-day -day life. All they cared about was the Kobra, was their mu was their pay and their food. They weren't serving the people properly. They were misappropriating what was happening in the temple. And God destroyed Shiloh, not because we weren't praying in Shiloh, not because we didn't be corporate, but because we misbehaved in our social behavior. Look what happened to Shiloh because of bad lack of social justice. The same thing happened to Yerushalayim. And God says, now because you're doing all these terrible things, I'm talking to you and you don't listen. But see to the Baita Shani crush me, I love. Yeah, I'm going to do to the house that you're putting all your hope in, Ashar Temple Trimba, and to the city which I gave to your ancestors, the same thing I did to Shiloh, they'll all be destroyed. So that's Yermio. So according to Yermio, it's clear. Yermio's warning, the temple will be destroyed, is for lack of good behavior. We can't miss that. No, there's a lack of social justice. He's not saying because you didn't keep Shemitah. He's saying you didn't apply the laws of Shemitah in your day-to-day -day life. That's what he's saying. Your, your society is corrupt. You're not taking care of the stranger, the orphan, the widow. You're full of corruption. You don't care about human life. That's why God's not allowing you, because if the people, it's specifically because you're religious, because you're coming to the temple and bringing Korbanot and praying to God, and when you leave the temple, it doesn't reflect itself in your day-to-day -day behavior, I can't allow that temple to represent God. But that's his key point in the beginning. Um, now, so that's my first point about who's to blame. It's not because the farmers didn't keep Shemitah in the Shemitah year that God's destroying the temple even though that might be the impression. It's not because they didn't keep Shemitah Safim. It's not because the bankers aren't lending money. It's because the laws of Shemitah and Shabbat Haaretz are so meaningful, but their purpose is educational and have to have an effect on how we act during the six years that we are working. And in day-to-day -day life in Israel, even though they're returning to the temple and praying to God, the society remains unjust. Now, notice 
he's blaming, now, now we're talking about the blame. So we're not going to blame the farmers, and not just the bankers. We're going to blame now the prophets. Why? The prophets are supposed to give guidance to the people about how they need to behave. So what message are they hearing from the rabbis? I remember, a Navi is God's spokesperson. Someone who understands the ways of God, what he expects from his people. And therefore, the prophets are the people telling the people, the prophets are telling the people on behalf of God what God wants from them, what they need to do to have God on their side. It's clear that Yirmiyah was saying that his colleagues, the other prophets, he calls them Nevi Sheker, but we'll see in a minute, they're God's Nevim, who's saying things in God's name he never said, are misleading the people by not, they're, they're not telling them what's critical, what's most important, what God expects from them. They're misleading them and what God wants from them. They're saying the main thing God wants is prayer, and he's saying the main thing God wants is prayer has to be transformative and change how you behave. Now, after all these warnings about social justice and fixing your society, um, Yirmiyahu says as follows in chapter 25. This was word of God to Yirmiyahu in the fourth year of Yoyakim, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylonia. That was the Babylonian um, control of the Middle East after the battles of Karkamish, et cetera, if you know the, your outside history, began in the fourth year of Yehoiakim. And Yirmiyahu has a prophecy now to the people and says like this, for the last 22 years, for the last 23 years, during the reign of Yehoshua in these early years of Yehoiakim, I've been giving you, I've been giving you rebuke. So remember Hashkem V'daber? We saw that in Dibre Amin. I've been warning you over and over again, and you haven't listened. Guys have been sending his prophets to warn you, and you didn't obey them, you didn't listen to them, you didn't hearken to them. And what was I telling you? Improve your behavior, fix your bad ways. If you want to stay in the land, which God gave you, and don't follow the other gods, and don't go astray, and you didn't listen. And therefore, he's referring to the Muslim he's been giving, like he talked about in chapter 7. Now, I'm going to go back real fast to how we started this year. Look in Divar Yamim. Remember what are they saying? Um, King Tzitkel was being punished because he didn't listen to him. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. What did the people do? The people weren't listening their, uh, their behavior was disgusting in the eyes of God. Here it says, God sent his messengers, his dream, like Yirmiyahu, to warn the people. But the people were making fun of Yirmiyahu. We'll see, they wanted to kill him. So what he's saying is, he's referring here to Yirmiyahu. And what happened to Yirmiyahu? God sent Yirmiyahu to get the people to do proper tshuva. Instead of obeying him, they just made fun of him. Because no one likes Nevim who tell the people to improve your behavior. They'd rather hear, you know, say these magic words and God will save you. Or bring a sacrifice and God will save you. Now, um, let's go back now to Yermiel chapter 25. Or were we? Here. In chapter 25, we had his Nevoah. A warning. I've been warning you for the last 23 years. Now comes the bombshell of Yermiel and the most critical, the turning point event that leads to this temple being destroyed. Okay. Therefore, God says, because I've been warning you for the last 23 years to use the temple properly, to fix your society, and you just don't get it. You haven't become a nation that sanctifies God in your day-to-day -day behavior. You haven't fulfilled the goal of Chumash. I, I, I allowed you to return and rebuild your temple. You're not using it properly. It's not reflecting a just society. Therefore, in the Therefore, I'm sending nations from the north, and I'm appointing Nebuchadnezzar Melech Babel Abdi. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel, was God's servant, meaning God sent Nebuchadnezzar to punish us. I'll bring him on the land, okay? And listen to the words, the Shama again, the desolation, and Chorvot Olam. That's the words we had in Divar Yamim. That's the words we had in the Tochacha as well. God is bringing Nebuchadnezzar to punish the land for the bad behavior. Not just because of Shemitah. Okay? 
We're all familiar. Vaitakor says, Lot the Chorbal Shamal, the Duba may let Melop of El Shivim Shana. Okay. The land will be Chorban Shmama, like we saw before. And all these nations, not just Israel, the whole Middle East is going to be under Babylonian rule for the next 70 years. That's Yirmiyahu's 70 years. Yirmiyahu's saying, God is bringing the Babylonians to control the Middle East for the next 70 years because of the sins of the lack of social justice. And therefore, God's not saying, I'm bringing the Babylonians to kick you out of the land because you weren't keeping Shemitah. I'm taking away your sovereignty because you misused your sovereignty. I gave you sovereignty to build a nation that sanctifies God in its day-to-day -day behavior. You did a bad job. I have to take away your sovereignty. Okay? As, and that's going to be your punishment. And what Yermiel is going to say is that if you accept Babylonian sovereignty and you accept that you've done wrong, you don't have to leave your land. Yermiel says the, the temple doesn't need to be destroyed. You don't need to go into exile. You can be under Babylonian rule and you can stay in your land and do rehab, do rehabilitation in your land. The problem is the people don't listen. Yoakim doesn't listen. He rebels against Babel. He goes into exile. Then Tzidkiel becomes king. Okay? Um, during the This happens during Yoakim and also during Tzidkiel. Okay? Tzidkiel becomes king on the condition that he's subservient to the Babylonians. And that goes back to what we saw in the beginning. When, when Nebuchadnezzar first came with the first wave of exile and exiled Yoakim, Yoakim put up a white flag. He left. And the Babylonians put in a puppet king, a vassal king, Tzitkiel. Actually, his name was first Matanya. Sounds like Netanyahu. He put a vassal king in. Matanya changed his name to Tzitkiel to show that he's in charge, hoping that he'll do Tzedek and Mishpat. And he wasn't supposed to rebel. He was supposed to give in to Babel. And Tzitkiel was king. He didn't listen to Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu told him to accept Babylonian sovereignty, not to rebel. And he rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. That's the reason for the Korban. Because they don't listen to the Nevim. The, the, the God's Nevim, God's true Nevim, told the people, accept Babylonian sovereignty, don't rebel against them. If you don't rebel against Babylonia, you can keep your temple and you can stay in your land and you can do rehab. And seven years later, the Babylonians will fall and then you'll get your land back and things will be fine. But the people don't listen. Okay. Now, what's Yemiel tell them? He tells them as follows. Um, in, in chapter 27, he tells Yirmiyahu to make um, a yoke. And he, Yirmiyahu goes around with yoke telling everybody, not just Yirmiyahu, but all the people gathering in your shrine, planning a rebellion against Babel, to accept the yoke of Babel and don't put your hopes with Egypt. He says, I'm giving all the nations to Abdi, okay? and God's giving the whole land. Remember, to Asher Yashar Be'inai, those that way see fit. That's what Rashi quotes in the beginning of Chumash. The land belongs to God. He gives it. He takes it away from us if we don't deserve it. He gives it, takes away from them if they don't deserve it. But God, the people living in land have to be worthy of the land. And therefore, now I'm giving it them Nebuchadnezzar because you're misusing it. Right? And then it says, If you don't accept Babylonian sovereignty, then you're going to go under sword, you'll be punished, you'll be destroyed. Okay. But Yud Aleph, any nation who accepts Babylonian sovereignty, he can stay in his land. Now, this applies to all the nations, especially to Israel. And this is what Dibar Yemi was talking about. I said exactly this to Tzidkiel, the king of Yudah. Right? If you want to stay in your land, if you want to save the temple and stop the destruction of the temple, you need to accept Babylonian sovereignty. Don't rebel against Babel. That's your punishment. That's why Yirmiyahu's words are so difficult. That's why they want to kill him for being a false prophet because they can't accept the God would say be under foreign rule. He says, Why should you die if you don't give in to Babel? Because if you rebel, you're going to lose. Now we're going to see who the false prophets were. Who are the prophets? They're God's prophets telling the people, misleading the people, saying, we can't defeat Babel. Right? All we need is unity. All we need is to daven, to pray. Pray harder to God. Come to Bidash, pray, and God will get rid of Babel, but you need to daven harder. But they're telling the people, we can fight Babel. If, we, if God's on our side, we have to pray harder to God. 
And that's the Nevi'im, those are the prophets, saying things in God's name that God never said, misleading the people. So you have these, again, call them rabbis or prophets, saying things in God's name he never said, misleading the people, thinking that prayer alone will get rid of the Babylonians, and they're not giving the message of improving their behavior. He says, he says, he says, don't listen to the words, these Nevim, God's Nevim, who tell you don't serve Bavel. They're saying things in my name I never said. Here it says, God, God says, I didn't send them. They're saying things in God's name that God never said, and that's going to lead you astray. Okay? And the Kohanim, tell the Kohanim and the people, call Hashem. They're giving false prophecies in two years' time. All the, what was exiled during Yehoiachin is going to come back. The worst is over. We're still in the process of redemption. He says, no, it's over. And if I'm asking who are to blame, had, who's to blame for destruction of Yerushalayim, God wanted to save the city, like we saw in the end of Deber Amin. He sent his name to save the city. All we needed to do was accept Babylonian rule, accept our mistakes, realize that was the reason. Instead, the false prophets are encouraging the people, rebel against Babel. We have to be sovereign in our land. This is our country. No foreign powers allowed to be here. And they don't accept the punishment for the bad behavior. So God says, alehem, okay? Serve Babel and stay alive. Why should let the story, let, why allow the city to be destroyed? And if the real prophets, if they're really representing properly, what should they do? They should pray to God that the rest of the kingdom shouldn't go into Beit HaMikdash, meaning accept Babylonian sovereignty, work, re rehab your country, improve your behavior to be worthy of keeping your temple, and then um, remain under Babylonian rule, and then the temple will need to be destroyed. So it's the prophets to blame now. If I'm asking who's to blame, Again, it's not the farmers and not just the bankers. It's the way the people are acting. They're, they're unjust society. But the biggest culprits are the people claiming to represent God, so-called rabbis at the time, who are encouraging the people to rebel against Babel, even though God said not to, because they're so sure that the right thing to do is to be sovereign in our land. And they think that all you need to do is pray to God in the temple. And that's enough for him to get rid of the Babylonians. Okay. Then God says the rest of the kingdom are going to be leaving. Let me just skip to the famous story in chapter 28. There's an argument between Yirmiyahu, um in the fourth year of uh, Tzidkiyahu, in the fifth month. Hanani ben Azur is a Navi from Gibbon. He's a well-known, prominent Navi. In the Beit HaMikdash, a friend of the Kohanim. And in, in the Beit HaMikdash, in Shul, middle of davening, there's an argument between Yirmiyahu and Hanani ben Azur. Two prominent rabbis or prophets giving having a big argument. Hanani ben Azur says, Kol svot omed I'm breaking the yoke of Bavel. In two years' time, everything's coming back. Right? Nebuchadnezzar is losing. The Kelim of the Beit HaMikdash are coming back. Remember, it wasn't destroyed yet, but some of the Kelim were exiled. The king's coming back. Yehoniah was exiled, is coming back within two years. Everything's going to be great again. And Yirmiyahu challenged, says, No, you're lying. He goes, and what he does, uh, Hanani ben Azur takes Yirmiyahu's yoke and breaks it in public and says, I'm breaking the yoke of Bavel. Basically, there's a big argument among the rabbis in the Beit HaMikdash. Do we give in to Bavel? Don't we give in to Bavel? What do we focus on? More prayer and sacrifice or fixing our ways and, and accepting foreign rule until we learn our lesson? So Yirmiyahu says, Halavai, you're right, but you should know that you're, you're misleading the people. Okay, so Hanani ben Azur takes Yirmiyahu's yoke that was on his and he breaks it. And Hanani says in front of everybody, um, and, and, and Yirmiyahu loses, he loses the fight because everyone's clapping for, for Hanani. Why? Because people listen to the Nevi'im who say what they want to hear. Okay? Too many people, what happens? What Nevi, how are the people supposed to know? The people are listening to the Nevi'im who are giving the message they want to hear, not what they need to hear. I just want to bring two psukim from Echa, and one pasuk from Echa, and then one from, um, I think, uh, this is an Echa Perkvet. Nevi'aich chazulach shavatafel. 
your prophets misled you, gave you phony visions. They didn't tell you what you're doing wrong. Okay? And they've given you proper guidance and told you to repent properly, to fix your ways. Okay? You could have, the temple didn't need to be destroyed. But instead, they give you false prophecies, giving false hopes that Babel is going to fall if you dive in better. Okay? And they basically led you astray with, with their false hopes. Um, also, it's interesting if you know your Nevoah for Yechezkel, when Yechezkel sees the Shekhinah leaving, it's exactly when they begin the rebellion against Babel. Remember, the rebellion is beginning in year four and five. The, the, the majority of, of Yechezkel's Nevoah to the people exiled in Babel are during the years when all the false prophets are saying Babel is going to fall and everyone's coming back. And God's saying, my Shekhinah is leaving your and going to Babel, but that's a class in in Yechezkel. So I know I've taken a minute for questions, but uh, of course I could have quoted Isaiah saying what will bring what will bring uh, redemption, remember? This theme is so obvious, all through Nevim, and therefore in our own time, if we're going to remember um, on Tisha B'av, what happened, of course I remember why it happened, and when you look carefully uh, with Nevim, the, their key message, it's not. It's very easy to say, oh, they were believed in other gods, they bowed down to to crazy idols, and that's why God destroyed the temple, or they didn't keep the laws of Shemitah. When you read the Nevim carefully, Yishayel earlier, and for sure Yirmiyel, and later Zechariah, it's clear God is angry, especially because we're religious, but the way the religious people are acting, the lack of social justice in the society, the way they're talking to each other, they're reacting one another, and the rabbis giving false prophecy, misguiding the people, not telling people what they need to hear, but what the people want to hear, that's what causes the korban. Um, yeah, Hanania, the Nevim thought they they were they were Nevim, meaning they were representing God, telling the people how to keep halacha, etc. But they were very we call it nowadays right wing. They were encouraging. They were they were they were in a position of leadership, but misusing it, and they're telling people what they were hoping God was saying, even though God never said it. But that's a class in Yirmiyah why they're lying, and do they know what they're up to? But no one. Everyone thinks Yirmiyahu is a bad guy. And that's what, so it's like, why God allowed that to happen? Again, that's a class in Yirmiyahu, not for now. But I think what's important things to, according to, we saw in Echa, and we saw in Divari Amim in the very beginning, the people to blame are, it's more, the prophets are more to blame. The religious leadership is heavy on the blame. Okay? The king didn't listen to Yirmiyahu by rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and making fun of the Nevim who told them to do tshuva. And again, the uh, if, I, if we take a take-home message, okay, I know my time is up, okay? So I have to stop here. But the rest, you can look over the sources and you'll see them. And history repeating itself. It, it's up to us. It doesn't have to repeat itself. It tends to repeat itself. But anyone read between the lines can figure out what direction we're going in. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And I know we have to finish on time. There's another class coming up in hey, two minutes. Thank you, Rabbi. If you, I'll, I'll give you 45 seconds to look at the questions if you'd like. Okay. Well, just, was, just tell me if there's anything that needs uh, immediate um, attention. Yeah, anything major. I didn't really see as it was going on. Just let me quick a quick look. Oh, I asked, how's a common person supposed to know who's right near me? Or the kind of oh, perfect. That's a famous question. Basically, Yechess is going to say, Kavon HaDoresh, Kavon HaNavi. The people responsible for going to the rabbis who are saying what they want to hear. If you read Chumash carefully, if you knew Yishayel beforehand, right? That's, the false prophets are to blame, but the people listening to the false prophets are just as guilty. Because the false prophets say it because people want to hear it. So if you become popular, but by the people should know better, should know what rabbis to listen to. Now, when a rabbi gives you the wrong message, when he hears what you want to hear, and so what you need to hear, don't blame, you blame the people and not just the rabbis. Yechezkel is harsh on that. That's Yechezkel chapter 14. Kavon HaNavi, Kavon HaDoresh. And people need to know better. You can't blame everything on the rabbis. But that's why God gave us Chumash and gave us Kashu Mishpatim and God gave us the Tochacha and God gave us Shema every day and the laws in Devarim. Um, quick, 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 quick question. Um, I thought, I thought, and because I'm just a simple Jew, that you're supposed to always follow what your rabbi says, no matter what the rabbi says. So if your rabbi, so this, you're just saying no. You're just saying that you should, 
if you think your rabbi is leading you astray, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Look for a different rabbi. Yeah. You should look for a rabbi, rabbi whose message makes fits the theme of the Bible. Yeah. All right. I'm going to have to take. Uh, okay, we'll stop. Yeah. We'll have okay. to stop. That, that's more class. classes, but if you come to our class on Navi, we'll. Rabbi Lee Tag will be back on Sunday morning at 11 15. So you can ask him all the questions you'd like. And uh, we'll say hi to Dr. Ilana Steinhain, who is making her debut on Turn Motion. So, Ilana, you here? Say hello. We'll, we'll take about a two and a half minute break just so people can not get a cup of coffee. Um, even in Israel, you have to wait about 10 minutes. And I'm going to Mariv. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have to go to Mariv. We'll see you Sunday. And God be well, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.